name is Lisa Schultz. I'm one of the co-directors of the Murphy Institute, which is one of the many sponsors of this event today. For those of you who have been here all day, welcome back for the main event for tonight. And for those of you who are just joining us for this talk, welcome. Um, this past July, Dr. Julie Sullivan became the 15th president of the University of St. Thomas. She was our first layperson to be to hold that post and the first woman to hold that post. She came to us from the position of executive vice president and provost of University of San Diego after a very distinguished career as a scholar um, and an educator of accounting and tax in business schools at the University of California at San Diego, at uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the University of Oklahoma. Um, she has now lived through our horrific, very horrific first winter, and she hasn't quit. <laughs> but she's not here with us tonight. She's in Florida, and I don't blame her. Uh, actually, Dr. Sullivan knew um, when we organized this conference that she had a long-standing professional conflict, and she was not going to be able to be here. But she really wants to be part of our um, of our conversation, and she wants to tell you that herself. Um, so, um, on, um, I would like to invite us all to listen to um, our president, Julie Sullivan. Thank you. I am delighted to welcome you to Conversations in Feminism, Law, and Religion, and I regret that I cannot be among you for the events of this evening and tomorrow. This conference is illustrative of the abiding commitment of the University of St. Thomas to interfaith dialogue and to discussion across disciplinary boundaries of the important issues of human existence and human community. That commitment is reflected in the St. Thomas sponsors of this conference, which include the J. Phillips Center for Interfaith Learning, the Luann Dummer Center for Women, the Muslim Christian Dialogue Center, the Siena Symposium for Women, Family, and Culture, the Murphy Institute for Catholic Thought, Law, and Public Policy, and the St. Thomas College of Arts and Sciences. We are very pleased that the conference has drawn together distinguished scholars and practitioners in law and religion, both local and from around the world, and coming from various faith traditions to participate in these conversations. Our commitment to recognizing the equal dignity of women and men as made in the image of God embraces a commitment to critically examine how law has an impact on the real lives of women throughout the world. We must continue to ask how our religious communities and our secular governments are living out that promise of equal dignity and equal participation, including tapping women's abilities to serve as leaders in both religious and secular life. Many women in our world encounter serious obstacles to the fulfillment of that promise, whether because of family violence or unequal employment opportunity or other barriers to women's ability to fulfill their destinies and to utilize their gifts for the sake of the world. I'm grateful to those of you who are attending this conference for being willing to have these difficult conversations about how we can move forward to a more just and productive future for women and those whom they care for in their many roles. Good evening, everybody. My name is Marie Failinger. I teach at Hamlin Law School here in St. Paul. I'm a member of the ELCA, and I'm very pleased to introduce my bishop today. Bishop Elizabeth Eaton is the fourth presiding bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, one of America's largest Christian denominations at about four million members. An Ohio native, Bishop Eaton learned, earned her BA in music education from the College of Worcester and her Master of Divinity from Harvard University. She served as a pastor in congregations in uh, Worthington, Boardman, and Ashtabula, Ohio, and she was elected bishop of the ELCA Northeastern Ohio Synod in 2006 and re-elected in 2013, and of course now she's the presiding bishop. Um, 
she's had a very diverse set of experiences within the Lutheran Church, uh, the liaison bishop to the ELCA Church Council. She's also worked on the Committee on Memorials, which is our committee that uh, proposes uh, policies and faith statements and so forth that the church passes at churchwide assemblies. She served the church nationally with the ELCA malaria campaign, the Lutheran Metropolitan Ministry, and the Conference of Bishops Executive Committee, and the Domestic Ready Bench. I don't exactly know what that is, but maybe she'll tell us. Uh, she's also worked in Ohio, at the Ohio with the Ohio Council of Churches and Ohio's Lutheran Plan Giving. She's given her talents to Lutheran higher education as well through service on the boards of Trinity Lutheran Seminary and Capital University. Interdenominationally, she served on the Lutheran Episcopal Coordinating Committee and worked on the Lutheran Episcopal Dialogues. Internationally, she's been a delegate to the 1984 Lutheran World Federation Assembly in Budapest and to the German Democratic Republic. Bishop Eaton may have a quite unique perspective. I suspect uh, she is in a very small sorority. There are not a lot of bishops out there who are also mothers and pastor's wives. Her husband is an Episcopal priest. She is orthodox in her allegiance to Cleveland sports teams. <laughs> she is ecumenical in her feeling about church potlucks, as long as you go beyond green bean casserole. And one uh, uh, writer about her uh, noted that she loves roller coaster rides, which will fit real well with the ELCA. Um, those who know her has, have described her as a unifier, very down to earth, a wise, compassionate, and faithful leader, an encourager who can see people's gifts, fearless, a person who walks the talk. I think she might, however, be happiest with the assessment that she has a great passion for the gospel, and that comes across to everybody who he hears her preach and teach. Bishop uh, Eaton will be speaking for a while, and then we will take questions and engage in dialogue. I'm happy to give you Bishop Eaton. I was expecting Mother Teresa to walk up here just now. <laughs> Thank you for that generous introduction. Um, thanks to uh, Dr. Sullivan, who is... Um, I don't know how she wanted to leave the snow, but is experiencing the warmth in Florida, and also to Sean Harris and Marie Fallinger and Lisa Sheldes and all of the team who put together this marvelous conference. Um, I was with Bishop Svenigsen and Ragnus this morning with our clergy in the um, Ministerium of St. Paul and um, the Minnesota Area Synod, so I, I missed that. Um, and it looks like a stellar uh, group, but I am happy to be here. Um, it's, it's interesting for a Lutheran to be at a university named for St. Thomas Aquinas. And when I dug into your, uh, your, your web page a little bit, I was stunned to find out that the, the sports teams here, the nickname are the Tommies or the Tomcats, and you're actually pretty good. And I'm thinking that St. Thomas Aquinas is probably the least athletically inclined person in Western <laughs> Christianity. I was, trying to, I was trying to square that. Of course, we have a, 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 Meth, a Methodist Wesleyan University in Ohio, and they're the battling bishops, but I understand that. <laughs> Also in Wilmington College, they're the fighting Quakers. All a little <laughs> jarring, so. So I was, I was asked, and it seemed like a good idea at the time, to come and speak to this group that is far over my, um, uh, my uh, educational and uh, scholarly credentials about women, law, and religion. So I'll skip the law part, though I did take one course in constitutional law when I was at Harvard University taught by Archibald Cox. Well, I mean, he stood up in front of us, and you know, then we had teaching assistants do the real stuff. But the interesting thing about him, not only that he was courageous, courageous, but he, his tie would always match his socks. So he, <laughs> he maroon, well, crimson, I, I suppose he was uh, wearing. Anyways, here's a story from the Hebrew Scriptures, which is also part um, of of our tradition as uh, Lutheran Christians, and, and in this, it's a story I think that you will find familiar immediately. It's a, an episode with Abraham and his wife, Sarah. 
and they are uh, in the process of going from Ur to the promised land, and they've stopped for a while, and three strangers come to encounter them. And Abraham is sitting out under the shade while Sarah's in the tent, and these three say to him, Where is Sarah your wife? And he, Abraham, said, She is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you in the spring, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you in the spring, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, No, but you did laugh. This, um, this passage, this story, uh, I think is indicative of part of the... Um, I think the struggles of women, particularly in, le in religious leadership, but I think also those of you who serve in positions of leadership in other fields, is that um, we're often invisible, and we're often not at the table when decisions are made. And if we are ever in, uh, engaged, we're not taken seriously. We were trying to work on this, uh, my staff and I, and they said, well, what would be my hope as a woman religious leader? I said that we would not be invisible and that we would be taken seriously. If you look at this passage from, from Genesis, uh, the overwhelming interpretation of this passage is that somehow Sarah was, um, was not being respectful or faithful, and that in her laughter, this was just a clear indication of the weakness of this woman who could not trust in the promises of God. Never mind that in chapter 17, Abraham had fallen on his face laughing when God told him that they were going to have a child. Never mind that that, that went on. That's always been attributed to, uh, ascribed to, to Abraham as laughter for, of incredulous joy. <laughs> it doesn't say that about either one of them. But for Sarah, almost universally in commentaries, except for one that I, I read recently from Dr. Diane Jacobson, it's, it's ascribed to her that, that this is a, a sign of unfaithfulness and weakness. Now, you think about this situation. She's in the tents. And uh, th these people, these guests for whom she is making a lavish feast, showing proper hospitality, are now announcing that she is going to have a child. And that's great news for Abraham. But... <laughs> He's not going to have swollen ankles in about seven months. This is not going to be part of, part of this. So it's going to happen to her. Physically, she will, she will embody and her, she, will change, she will become out of shape in order to bear this promise. And she's not even consulted in any of this. And then to, to somehow then say that her laughter is uh, derisive or unfaithful adds another layer of um, condemnation upon her. Dr. Jacobson really points out that, that the word in Hebrew, as many of you know, for laughter is Yitzhak, Isaac. And so it's not so much that she laughed, but that she Isaaced. And that the wonderful turnaround in, in this is that when somehow I think people think God had the last laugh, but I think maybe, I think maybe that uh, Sarah had the last laugh as she, she uh, saw newborn laughter in her lap after it was born. We'll come back to that um, toward the end of, of, of this presentation. So what are, the things, what are the things that make us invisible or make us uh, to be considered less than um, worthy of full consideration? What are some of the barriers? And now for uh, the, the, the men in, in, our, in our audience, I'm going to try to do this gently to understand that it, uh, we, we did this this morning um, with, with our clergy this morning. Um, how many of you are left-handed, men and women? Okay. How many times a day are you reminded that you're left-handed? Yeah. Every time you sit down to eat, probably, right? Or we found out today when you sew, thread unravels because it assumes a right-handed sewer. I didn't know that. How many of us are right-handed? Yeah. When do we ever have to think about being right-handed? And that's just, pardon me? When we type. When we type. I don't know. I just use these. It seems to work perfectly well. So, um, so the, the, it's not that right-handed people are evil oppressors, it's just the economy of scale makes the world set up for right-handed people, we would say. 
Um, we know that, you know, I showed my child a rotary dial tele telephone once, but those used to be set up for right-handers. Uh, measuring cups are set up for right-handers. Scissors are for right-handers. A, a lot of these things are set up for right-handers, and it just, it just works that way. It's when it slips over to making value judgments about left-handed people and right-handed people that a problem comes in. So that somehow right-handedness is virtuous and left-handed is, is, is not. We shake hands with our right hand, probably because it was a weapon thing. We salute with our right hands if we're in the military. Um, we talk in the Christian tradition about Jesus being seated at the right hand of God. But what about left-handers, we talk about a left-handed compliment. Or the word Latin for, for, for left in Latin is sinister. And so when it starts to slip over to value judgments, that's when it's difficult. So men, you're not, you're not intrinsically horrible people. Um, it, it's, it's not your fault, but the world is set up for male human beings. And in our culture, it's mostly set up for white male human beings. That's just the way it, it, it works. But there are some significant consequences for that that are unintended. For years, for centuries probably, any me medical research was predicated on male subjects. So a dosage that might be good for a 180-pound man would probably not be good for a 120-pound woman. Or since our, our systems are different, assuming that the male is the norm and women are somehow just littler men brought some serious consequences medically. That's just one thing. It wasn't intentional. It just worked that way. I think in law practice, um, I think those of you who are in the field of law have come across a lot of things where laws are set up to protect uh, the, the, the male majority. And, well, we know for women couldn't own property in this country for a long time. It just, it's just the way we look at it. Male is the norm. We talk about co-eds. Well, why aren't the guys the co-eds? They're the eds, we're the co's, if you think about that. It's interesting. And, in fact, uh, C.S. Lewis, um, a Christian... Um, a theologian from England, um, who actually happened to be Irish, so happy St. Patrick's Day to all of us who are part Irish. Um, but he, he I, I greatly admire his work, makes uh, Christianity very accessible to people who um, are, are not familiar with it, even accessible to those of us who are. But in one of his works, he talked about male and female, that male was the voice and the female was the echo. So that's, that's the reality that, that, that comes, about, that we, we experience. But, um, there are some other things that um, go beyond just an assumption about what the norm is that actually make things very difficult, I think, for us to live, as the president said, in full dignity as human beings one in another. The authors in, in, the, in the preface or the introduction to the book that you, you've been hearing all of their wonderful presentation make the, make the point that there is this long-standing uh, tradition of, of scientism and irrationality and that male human beings tend more towards scientism, which is um, uh, scientific, uh, not uh, um, spiritual, more spiritual, less carnal, less material, and women tend toward irrationality, which is tied to our, our human bodies, to being created, to being carnal, to being um, part, of, part, of the, part of the earthliness of the world. And they're already assigned, and have been for a long time, value judgments. It's better to be spiritual and um, dispassionate and, and not and so tied to the, to the physical. And it's wrong and dangerous in some cases for, for people to be so tied to the physical and the carnal. This was true as in Greek philosophy and carried over a lot into Christian um, theology and understanding. It's not so much the case in, in Jewish thought because there isn't this dichotomy between spirit or, or the spirit and, and, and the corporal. The, the, that's more integrated in Jewish thought. And I, I don't have the, um, the uh, capacity to speak about Islamic understanding there. But that, that was automatically assumed. It, it, Martin Luther um, uh, just... Here's one thing with Martin Luther in one of his really insightful, uh, politically correct statements said um, that men have broad shoulders and narrow hips, therefore they're made for thinking. It just <laughs> logically follows. <laughs> and women have narrow shoulders and broad hips, so therefore we're made for bearing children. And this, this dichotomy is placed there. Um, and he was actually not as bad as some. Um, so what happens when women um, enter into non-traditional leadership roles? What happens uh, when someone like me, shaped like this, inhabiting a body like this, becomes the leader of a Christian denomination? 
And they're, they're, they're getting to be more and more of us because uh, the Episcopalians, Catherine Jeffrey Shorey is their presiding bishop and the, uh, the, the bishop for the Methodists is also um, a woman. I just had this um, no, notion that uh, someone at some interview that I had to do was going to reference the John Knox treatise when um, all of these female, it turned out to be Catholic women, were queens in Europe, and he wrote this treatise called The First Blast of the Trumpet Against the Monstrous Regiment of Women. <laughs> but then Elizabeth I became queen and she was Protestant and he had to eat his words. It's just like, you could see him in a little Scottish accent and say, did I think that or did I say that out loud? I, I did, okay. <laughs> Well, a number of things we see happening, and we've seen this in other professions as well as in religious professions. Um, when women um, assume roles of leadership in, in significant numbers, I think there gets to be a tipping point where that profession then is seen as exclusively female. And in the church, there's a concern about feminization, that the men won't come to church anymore, as if feminization in itself is a bad thing. But it would be a loss if men felt somehow that they could not come to church uh, to be a part of a community uh, because of the prevalence of women in leadership roles. So there, I think we're only right now in our denomination, maybe we're the 19% female clergy at this point. And there are only 10 of us who are out of 66 uh, who are women bishops in our denomination. Still, that's worrying for some people. So that's one thing. And, and that's... Uh, it's, it's akin, I would say, to um, Samuel Huntington's concern about the United States, the Hispanization of the United States. If you've read this book, Who Are We or Who We Are by, by Samuel P. Huntington, um, he contends that, in fact, uh, we are not a nation of immigrants, but we are a nation of English settlers English Protestant of a certain stripe settlers and that all of the stuff that's been happening to us ever since then has really weakened and diluted the American spirit. And but in the same way, I think some people find that women in leadership roles begin to weaken the spirit as if the principle of, of who we are as a culture is necessarily male or, or, or primarily male. But there are also other more overt and angry reactions when uh, women uh, take leadership roles. I remember, I think it's about three years ago, when they just had this spate of really horrible ads on the Super Bowl. I mean, that was the one where all the guys were walking around in shirts but no pants. Do you, do you remember that one? And, and lavender was universally condemned as a, and don't, we don't need any lavender scented, but there was this one um, commercial that I found particularly offensive, and that was Danica Patrick, and you know she's, a, she's a, a race car driver, and she's actually pretty good, and she's also beautiful, but somehow this, this notion about this, this strong woman uh, being extremely successful and clearly a male-dominated um, uh, line of work, uh, the, so the commercial was, I don't know why she d agreed to do this, that there were these sort of nerdy guys, which was a kind of slam on, on that, but that somehow that they'd engineered some scientific thing where they could plant the suggestion and then she would march into her shower and they could watch this happening. So the sense was then that th you have to have some, that men, if they can exercise this kind of control over women, then somehow still have a sense perhaps of stability. And this is a, uh, we saw this with, um, with uh, Justice Kagan when she was trying to be um, confirmed that the attack was upon her femininity, that somehow she was not girl enough to be doing this and that, that, that if you can attack that, you can discredit the other. I had this experience um, right after I was elected. I was interviewed. I still laugh when people say, well, Time Magazine called up. I just laughed out loud when my staff told me that. But I was on the uh, Huffington Post and I think Morning Joe, which in itself was a frightening experience. <laughs> I'd never even seen Morning Joe, never. And so um, I filmed at the um, uh, CMB, MS, or CNBC um, affiliate in Chicago and uh, our older daughter lives in Chicago with her husband so she came to the hotel the night before and said, okay, I'm gonna prep you on Morning Joe. And uh, it was the one where um, oh, was it? Russell Brand had been the guest. Did you ever see that one? It was chaos. They were beating up on him. They were yelling. They were shouting. It was chaos. I just put the covers over my head. And it, and it was also at the same time that, um, th that um, Miley Cyrus was doing that horrible, pathetic dance. You know, really her father should talk to that girl. Um, but then also Syria had just gassed its citizens. So my staff was briefing me on everything in case it came up. And I had this horrible feeling they'd ask me about Syria and I'd launch into something about Miley Cyrus. But it never came up. 
that's a complete aside. However, on both of these, um, these interviews and other ones, people can text in and that shows up around the edge. And my daughters and I told my mother, don't, don't read that. Because some of the attacks on me were just vicious. I'm a man wannabe. They commented on the style of my hair and all this sort of stuff. And this, this is not unusual, I would say, for most of the lawyers out here trying to make your way through, or, or for any of us who are in these non-traditional roles. And I wonder, um, why, why is there this vitriol? Why is there this vitriol, particularly, I think, against, well, you lawyers and law professors can speak for your experience, but it seems to me for women and religion, and I think and for one, one reason is that, that, that religion and sexuality are such febrile, febrile um, uh, issues that, that somehow that there's um, this, this, we just can't think about it exactly calmly or emotionally. It's deep, it's deep within us. That this and it's also um, oh gosh I can't think of the word um, it's it's one of those places in life where there's it's a thin place Celts would call it where there's this sort of transitional area and that happens to us there and when this is disturbed I think people find this very uh, very upsetting very confusing very disorienting and one way that people react when this is disturbed is to lash out with some sort of some sort of violence. Um, in, in, in my case, fortunately, it was just uh, you know really ridiculous uh, texts and, and tweets. There's another thing that, that's that's prevalent, particularly I would say um, I can speak from my own tradition in, in Christian tradition. Um, it, when most uh, well, I think uh, world uh, religious expressions is that that imagery and language to describe the, the divine is almost exclusively male. Now we can find that in our, in our scriptures and in the Hebrew scriptures where there are, there are images and references to God as feminine. But those are, I, I would be, let me see, I'll put the clergy to test. Where in Isaiah is God um, compared to a woman? Where, as a mother you know, comforts her own child, yeah. Very, very well done. Is this former Missouri Synod? This is great, you know. <laughs> they know their Bible. This is good. And then also the, the passage in, in Jesus weeping over Jerusalem and speaking as if he were a, a hen gathering her own chi her chicks and they would not. I heard well, once from my dear husband in exegesis to sort of make this sound more wonderful is that, you know, we think of this hen as this fluffy thing and this was really could have been the, uh, the female, a uh, female hawk. And so there's this fierce thing. And so that makes it somehow more acceptable. He thought he was complimenting us and I'll get to that in, in a minute. Um, <laughs> But when we talk about uh, God in, in, in exclusively, with exclusively male imagery or male pronouns, um, that sets up a firm belief that God, in fact, is male. In Hebrew and, in scriptures and in Christian tradition, we understand in Genesis chapter 1 that God created humankind in God's image. Male and female were created in God's image. We always skip that and go right to Genesis 3. Where we have, which does not say anything about priority, that somehow, it, much as Archie Bunker once has said that Adam was created and Eve was a rib, a cheaper cut, it's not. That's not the sense there. But we we go there right away. In in Orthodox understanding, the priest needs to be male because the priest represents God. This is a, a congruence. I think people find it incongruous that women could be religious leaders because there's such a strong um, understanding or image of God as male though in the, the lesson we had today and we'll have on Sunday from the gospel, Jesus says, no, we worship God and God is spirit. So th this congruence. And so a woman cannot possibly be a religious leader because a woman is not male. It's, it's, it's assuming that somehow men could be God, which is obviously not true. Um, <laughs> But the, the definition in mathematics for congruence is that two figures are congruent if they have the same shape and size. And that congruence, as opposed to approximation, is a relation that implies a species of equivalent. And that's, I think that's deeply ingrained um, in, in our children, in us, in women, as well as men. And it's really kind of, it's, it, it's really, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't work if you think about somehow male human beings being the same species of the divine. It's like Cleveland sports fans, right? <laughs> we have from time to time in my lifetime been in, well twice, 
actually, been in the World Series. And the hype, it clearly, this was such a wonderful thing. I mean, we just, we have such a bad inferiority complex. And so for the, uh, one of our teams to make the World Series was such an exciting thing, and the hype was great. And then sure enough, eventually, the sports pages started to write that, well, you know, as some women wrote in, well, I can't get that excited about the World Series because, you know, as a woman, I could never play professional baseball. So there wasn't this congruence. As if there's congruence between a 54-year-old middle-aged guy who threw his back out that he's ever going to play professional baseball. <laughs> but it's that, it's that same thing that has happened, that, that, that image has come together, which makes it very, very difficult. Um, and then there's also the interesting... Uh, uh, the, the thing that happens is what do people in other cultures do with female bishops when we visit? And uh, how are we to be received? Um, all of our synods, which are comparable to dioceses, have companion dioceses around the world. Mine and my former synod was the Northern Diocese of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Southern Africa. So I, I, I went there to visit, and it's, it, it was a very traditional um, society there. And we visited this um, older farmer, and we went to his house, his lovely home. These are black South Africans. And all the women were in the kitchen preparing the meal, and that's where they ate. And all the men were in the formal sitting room. And then there was me. So you could see they were, they were thinking this as quickly as they could. Clearly I was a woman, but I was also a bishop. So I was granted honorary male status by virtue of being a bishop, and I sat with the men in the sitting room while the women were doing all the cooking. The next morning, the men were fed first along with me, and the women ate second. So it's, which, that for me was extremely difficult. But I think, I don't know, uh, Bishop Svenningsen, if you've encountered that yet, or I don't know, Bishop Rognes, you've seen that, that happen in, in, in your companion synods. So... Um, how then do we navigate through this? And I had a conversation with um, someone, two people from the law, in fact, one of them is one of the authors of the chapter in the book. How do, we, how do we get by? What do we do? Is it necessary for us somehow to become, uh, as the, uh, the, the cruel post was, man wannabes in order to function in a, in a male-dominated society? In some ways, yes, we have to be um, agile in navigating the male culture, and there, there are some things that we as women um, sort of have to play down in order to be accepted by the majority culture. And I wonder what that does to us as women and also to our relationships with men when somehow we cannot be accepted or really feel comfortable being fully female in, an, in a profession or a sphere that is overwhelmingly male. There's a lot of dissonance there. Um, that's, that's something. And it's something we have to watch all the time. I mean, I, I, I truly do love sports. It's not just to make guys think I'm, I'm fun. Um, my husband hates sports, so it, it, it really works out pretty well. Um, but but here, here is, here's, the, here's this, this difficult balancing act that we have to do. Um, and then we, we know that in our culture, it's, it's set up, it, it, we're, we're making progress now, uh, but the, 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 the business we hold up over and over again that you know, Mother's Day, which is my least favorite holiday of the entire year, because I spent my entire adult life working on Mother's Day. It's a Sunday, so I'm, you know, at work. Um, but then we hold up the virtues of motherhood. And clearly, if we didn't do our part in the motherhood bit, there wouldn't be people anymore. Um, but, but honoring that one day of year does not quite make up for the rest of the time where women who, who do men and women who do choose to start a family, the woman is still universally penalized for that. Uh, when I was uh, uh, pregnant with our first daughter, um, it was in, uh, it's 19, I was, she was born in 1986, so she's 27, and I was working in a large suburban congregation in um, Columbus, suburban Columbus, Ohio, in a very male culture there, the senior pastor, wonderful guy, but very male. I was in my seven, seventh month trying to negotiate a maternity leave which is good because Becca was a couple weeks early. It's a good thing we got that straightened around. But they were not going to give me a maternity leave. They said, you could take sick leave. Now, my, my male um, colleague had, been, uh, had a, a pretty catastrophic illness with a, a kidney issue and was out for all of Lent, Holy Week, and Easter. We had, in this congregation at that time, we had 400 people on a Sunday, multiple services. I was in charge of all of that. And they granted him as much sick leave that he needed. But when it came time to talk about maternity leave, this was just inconceivable. So one of the, one of the men on the church council said, we'll give you sick leave, 
uh, and if you, if, and, and then, then that's it. And another woman said, well, what if she's on a camping trip with your son at the youth group and breaks her leg? Oh, well, we'll evaluate that on a case-by-case -case basis. So, and that's, um, that, that's part of what we've, I don't know how squeamish you are, um, or if this is being recorded, but, um, <laughs> But we have made some progress in, um, we have a, a, a younger cohort of um, female uh, colleagues at the Lutheran Center in Chicago and they are having children and they are nursing their children, which means they have to ha have access to a breast pump during the day. We do have a lactation room. It used to be the sick room. So you had someone with the flu with women lined up in order, to, and it would take 15 minutes per woman. These people were fast, I never did that quickly. They were able to do that, and then that was, that's, in some places, you don't get that perk. There's no provision made, even though we say we honor the notion of, of uh, motherhood. So, now that I've painted this incredibly depressing picture of what it is, I think there's some possible, way for, possible ways forward, and since I'm Lutheran, I'm going to pick up on some possible uh, un Lutheran understandings of, of ways forward. In Lutheran theology, well, it's not ours. I mean, it's God's, first of all, and then, you know, probably St. Paul, but Bishop Rognes, he's the St. Paul area synod bishop, and he, his wife got him a T-shirt that said, you know, St. Paul is mentioned in the Bible, but Minneapolis never is, or something like that. <laughs> I'm learning about this here. This is a, a whole new thing for me. But um, so for us, it's, it's very, it's very, our um, understanding of, of, the, of, of the redemptive work of God in Jesus Christ is, is, is most clearly stated in justification, which means that this is something that God has done for us, not something that we do, which means it doesn't matter what your body type is. There's the, the, the one, one part of humanity is not somehow more deserving of love and grace than the other. We're all in this together. And so this is, a, I think, an equalizing understanding that somehow female sinfulness is not greater than male sinfulness. Another thing is, um, and I will use the word hermeneutic now. Um, they told me not to do that in interviews. Um, but since lawyers use the word hermeneutic, I, I can do that too. But our way, Lutheran's a way of reading and interpreting um, Holy Scripture. And, and Lutherans, at least our branch of Lutherans, and I would, I would argue that um, Martin Luther as well, we're not uh, biblical literalists. We don't have to say that every, every, we don't have to worry that there are different lists of apostles or how many sets of animals uh, Noah took with him on the ark. We're not worried about that. But when we read scripture, the, the most important thing for us is how is the gospel shown forth? So therefore, we can read something from Ephesians chapter 5 where Paul says, wives be subject to your husband as unto the Lord, and say that that is not the same as Jesus is risen from the dead. And in fact, people miss this, Paul ends that section by saying, well, I take this to mean the relationship between Christ and the church and not necessarily normative relationship between uh, husbands and wives. Or when we say that uh, we understand that we are justified or made right with God by grace through faith, not by anything we do, we can look at 1 Timothy where it says women will be saved by childbearing and say that is not, it does not have as much authority for us as other parts of scripture. So that's freeing for us when we take a look at some of the really difficult texts. We can't ignore them. We can't pretend that they're not there. I mean, they're, if Phyllis Tribble wrote the book, Texts of Terror, if you've read that. And it's, it's really, it's, it's chilling. I mean, so much for people who want to talk about, you know, uh, traditional biblical family values. They're like the Adams family values. They're just... But we can't, we can't ignore that. That's part of our sacred tradition, and that, that's there. But it, at least for us as Lutheran Christians, we have a way of saying that, that's, that, is, uh, that is God speaking to us, where we are able to see how God has been active in God's world, but not everything has the same uh, weight. We are also not, and I, I, oh well, I'm sorry to St. Thomas Aquinas and to the university, and thank you very much for hosting me, and I hope you'll still give me dinner afterwards, but Lutherans do not hold to the notion of natural law, particularly as set forth by Thomas Aquinas, which I would say, and this is a, a very rough um, uh, hashing of a, of, an, of a venerable tradition, that, the, um, that, that natural law is, is predominantly based on bi biology, and it upholds gender essentialism. And so uh, you, we can discover how God works by taking a look at the created world 
and we can understand how what it, the, the, the purpose or the essence of a thing, we can understand that by observing that. And so clearly it would be said that natural law would say that the, the reason for sexual relations is, is procreation and that's it. Or women have certain roles and men have certain roles. Instead, Lutherans have something that we call the orders of creation or the ordering of creation. And we would say that, that, that they would be uh, family, church, and society. And that God has created humanity to be in community, in relationship with one another. And that in that relationship, we are supposed to look for the welfare of others. And we're supposed to love and serve and give praise to God. But this is not a fixed understanding. So it's possible for under, for in those, uh, um, those understandings of these ordering, this ordering of creation to see that there's, there's a possibility for shifting and changing. So what was true perhaps about family structures in the 16th century for the good order and the good of the society might not be the same as in 21st century um, United States. What's true about how society should be uh, established and formed uh, that was true in Luther's day is not the same thing as it, 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 this would be true for us. They didn't understand democracies the way we have this now. And so these, within these, um, these orders, it's possible for there to be, um, gosh, evolution. Now I've really done it. That's the, there we go. Or, or, or shifting and changing so long as the good of the society is maintained and that also that, that, that people are caring for one another and that God is given worship and praise. Which I think gives us a lot of flexibility then not to be stuck in rigid um, uh, gender role uh, stereotypes. And this should be freeing for men as well as women, I, I think. The other thing is, is that um, the Aristotelians um, believed in um, that it was possible absolutely to know the essence of something. You could know someone completely or the essence of something. This Luther got all a big, you know, this is our consubstantiation, transubstantiation thing. For you non-Christians, it's trying to understand how the, the, uh, the elements, the, the bread and the wine, actually could somehow be conveying uh, the actual living Christ. And they were just, they were talking against each other. I did a, I did a song about this in uh, high school and got credit. You say consub and I say transub, you say whatever, okay. <laughs> we, we got an A. We had a, a reprise at the seventh period history class. Actually, the guy who wrote that with me did write for Saturday Night Live and actually was the co-author of the Hairspray musical, so Mar Mark O'Donnell. But Luther would say it's not possible for, um, in our terms, sinful or broken or finite or limited human beings really to know absolutely the essence of anything. And so uh, where the Aristotelians would say that they could take a look at a, a female human being and know that her absolute nature is child rearing and that's, that's it, is something that Lutherans would say we don't know. There's a great mystery about this which I think also gives us some flexibility. So back to Sarah and Abraham. Abraham who fell down in his face laughing and he was somehow upheld as a righteous man. Sarah's getting chided. Um, in this book by Jacqueline Bussey, a Lutheran um, scholar, The Laughter of the Oppressed. Have you, any of you read that book? It's, I recommend it, it's wonderful. She has a little bit about Sarah and Abraham but then takes a look at um, Elie Wiesel's um, Gates of the Forest, um, uh, uh, Morrison, Tony Morrison's beloved Sinshaku Endu's silence about how laughter actually becomes a subversive revolutionary resistance. And when she takes a look at that story, she says it's not so much that, that uh, Sarah is afraid or disbelieving, but that her laughter is an act of resistance calling, in, calling out um, a, a, a patriarchal Yahweh in this case who has been really slow in fulfilling his promises. Now, we Christians get the willies when people start to confront, confront God. But I'll tell you if, you, if you were careful about reading the Hebrew scriptures, there's a real relationship. And in the Hebrew scriptures, God is so real that people can call God out. Check the Psalms or, or over and over again. And so here, um, and we would say, as we look through the Hebrew scriptures, that, that God, in fact, can change. He repents from destroying Israel. He repents from destroying the people in the wilderness. And perhaps this resistance, this laughter resistance that Sarah uh, demonstrated to God is one way that we, the rest of us, can maybe start to um, make risible 
or maybe even ridiculous and therefore less powerful, those things that prevent the full humanity of both women and men. So now I'm willing to take questions. Okay, uh, was anyone like to either question, ask a question or a comment? I'm the mic czar. I'm going to hold the mic, but I will bring it over to you. Here's okay. one. Wait, wait, there you go. Yep. Oh, you nope. hold it. I have to hold it. Thank you so much for that very entertaining and educational talk. I took tons of notes. Oh. Um, I um, This is coming completely from the out from the outside, mm -hmm. I'm Muslim. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm interested in sort of the, the way you were unpacking what, it, what women's leadership means and um, this idea that God is understood as being male and how that sort of um, raises certain obstacles. Um, and I was wondering how you think about that same question through um, the idea of um, God as Jesus when Jesus is, is male and how, how um, cause there's that additional step for mm -hmm. in Christian theology that is different from Islamic theology. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you could comment on that. That would be great. Sure. And then I think back here in the red and then this gentleman, that's, a, that's an excellent question. It, that's a difficult, I'm very orthodox. I use the Trinitarian formula. I don't say creator, uh, redeemer, sanctifier. That's how we, that's the name that we as Christians have for God. For Jews, it's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For us, it's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which is, um, which, which does make it problematic when people somehow uh, affix this extra layer that, that redemption is only possible through a male agent. That, that would be difficult. The Greek for um, the spirit, that third part of the Trinity, um, uh, pardon me, the, the, the Hebrew, um, ruach, is that, that's a feminine uh, a pronoun, both. both. So you see, you have that. Diane Jacobson, she's excellent, versed in, in, in Hebrew. In, in English, we don't, ha we don't have a sort of gender neutral uh, thing to identify male and female. And it's, it's neutral, it's a uh, top noima, isn't it? It's a uh, neuter. neuter. But in the Old Testament, in the, in the Hebrew scriptures, um, wisdom is identified as female. And that's how we also understand the spirit. So there is some female imagery, but that's rejected by people. So that, that's, a, that's another thing that, that's off, off, often difficult. Some people like to talk about the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. And I get an argument with my husband about this. Um, you know, if we're going to have an incarnate God, it had to be one or the other, male or female. And I'm sure people wouldn't listen to women <laughs> then. Um, so that, that's the fact of human biology, um, but is... I guess the question is, is Jesus' maleness essential to his salvific action? And I'd say, I'd say, I would say no. But in the, in the popular culture, that's not understood. I mean, I mean I'm not usually mis mistaken for Jesus. But a lot of our male pastors, kids will say, are you Jesus? So that's, that's an added uh, problem. When we try to look at expanded language or inclusive language um, for, for God, uh, not, not in received texts, uh, I'm very careful about that. Uh, but I've stood in front of angry churches where people are saying when we have this gender neutral language, one man said to me, you have neutered God. <laughs> and he meant neutral. But you can see, but you can see how visceral that is. So yeah, that is, that's an extra layer of complexity. Thank you. Um, with respect to the uh, concern of some people um, in the ELCA and elsewhere, that the feminization of leadership can cause man flight. I'm just wondering how that view is reconciled with the experience of the Catholics because they have a real problem uh, recruiting religious and some have suggested that perhaps if women or gays or married people were allowed to be priests, um, there would be you know, more priests. I do not presume to. Um make policy decisions for the for the, our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters. But they have male, all male clergy and there's a man flight, that's a new one. But the, the, I think that, I think religion, um, 
I, I can't speak for Islam or Judaism, but for Christianity in this country, in a lot of ways, it's the women who show up for church. And, and I know in the Christian and the Jewish traditions, it's also the women who have been doing a lot, especially in the Jewish tradition, have been doing a lot of the religious instruction um, in, their, in their households and have that responsibility. So I don't know, guys, maybe you can tell us what we need to do to get more of you in church, synagogue, or mosque. You don't have to answer that if you want, but thank you. Could you expand a little bit on the concept of how the gospel is shown forth? Yes. Um, when, when we as Christians um, read scripture, it's important to see what shows God's action in Jesus Christ. So Luther would say, um, when we talk to biblical literalists, he would say that just as the manger cradled the living word of God, that's one way we, we, our concept for Jesus is the word made flesh, the word incarnate, that Jesus is the word. As the manger cradled that, so the words of scripture cradle Christ. And so if that's... If you have some uh, other part of scripture that says things like, you know, are you going to be saved by bearing children, and something else says, no, the wonderful gift is you've been saved, we've been re reconciled and redeemed by God's reconciling work in Christ, that has a lot more weight than something else. We also talk about law and gospel. We talk about scripture, interpreting scripture. So all these people who do this, you know, I talked about this this morning, you know, like that. Why they never got to the point where, you know, about Judas and he went and hanged himself. You know, why can't they put their finger on, never mind, that's a bad thing to think about. They never, they never get that one. So that's taking a look at that. And then um, we, when we're not much into allegory. We went the plain meaning of scripture, though Mark Allen Powell, who's a professor of New Testament at Trinity Seminary, said um, uh, Catholics, he, he's very blunt, Roman Catholics get it wrong when they say that tradition um, has the same stature as, as scripture, even when we talk about the creeds, because that's derived from scripture. But he says Lutherans have gotten it wrong when we will not, we refuse to have any even marginally allegorical understanding of scripture. We've lost a lot. So that was, that was news. Any other questions or comments? Here's a... Yeah. yeah. Um, your comment about the sort of the comic makes me think about uh, comic eschatology and, you know, the, the grand joke being in the Christian tradition, the resurrection, and earlier today, we had some wonderful Jewish scholars who were talking about Kaddish and what happens, that there is life beyond what we conceive of as death. And it, it just hit me, is, is the cosmic joke even better for those who don't believe? Well, you know, I wondered that when, what was his name, Carl Sagan died? You know, what a surprise he was having. <laughs> Though toward the end of his life, he started attending an Episcopal church. Never, never joined, but he said there's something, there's something else than what we can see and apprehend here. Yeah. Any other questions? We have. And I think you know, for our tradition, we're very clear about the resurrection. I think in in in, in, in correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and and of course in Islam, there's an understanding of a resurrection and an afterlife in in a, in a, in a, in a time of in in the presence of the lavish uh, love of God. In in Judaism, in some cases, the idea is that this is this is it. But, but, but that's not altogether a bad thing, because then those who, the, those who come after you there, that's how life continues. And we had, um, in Ashtabula, Ohio, which is this really small town, and we, we had one synagogue, it was next to our church, and, uh, but, we, but Mr. Goldman came and we were speaking to the CCD class for the kids who didn't go to um, Catholic school, and he says, let me tell you about this. And this is what I thought was beautiful. He said, we love God because we love God, not because of any hope for a future reward. Which is something I think at least, I'll speak for my tradition, Christians should. If we're just this transaction that I'm going to believe in God so I can get to heaven, get my, my ticket punched, how, how wrong is that? It's like saying, honey, I'm going to marry you because I hope I get your pension plan. Right? <laughs> Go ahead. Th thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could... Uh, do you see any connection between the passage that you read uh, relating uh, Sarah, Abraham, and the Lord and Isaac um, with the infancy narratives or the Annunciation in the new in the in the Christian scriptures um, or the, the the visitation of Mary to Elizabeth? Um, I just wonder if you think that the there's a kind of interesting reflection on some of the Hebrew scriptures in those in those passages and what that might or might not. If, if you read the Gospel according to Matthew, it's, it's all 
it, it, all kinds of references to salvation history, particularly references to, in his case, mostly Moses and, and, that, and that sort of thing. So yes, the interesting, I think there's also a, a, a nice parallel between uh, Mary and Hannah, who first sang that song, that, that rubble song, as Irish would say uh, in there. But yes, there, there, are some, there are parallels. And Jesus was a Jew, and was, that was part of that, that, that lineage. And um, in case people are wondering, Paul was very clear that, 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 that the Jews, that God has not abandoned the Jews, and that uh, Jesus um, said in, the salvation is from the Jews. And so there we have those, those parallels. To tell you, um, in, uh, my, my dad and my uncle were Irish, and my grandfather, Martin Cornelius, they, they people, our folks came over at the very end of the potato famine. And I'm mystified by this Green River in Chicago and the incredible amount of beer consumption that happens on St. Patrick's Day. And green beer, we were beer wholesalers. That right there is an unpardonable sin. But uh, when, for my St. Patrick's Day tradition is to, is, you know, we might sing a few rebel songs which get a little bloody. Uh, we toast uh, with Jameson's, my, my dad and my uncle, but we always we read the Magnificat because that's part of what that was about. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, I was wondering, you mentioned there were a couple of ways that we continue as women mm -hmm. to need to uh, maybe hold back on our femininity mm -hmm. or undermine it slightly in the presence of a, a more male-dominated culture or society. I wonder if you could name what those couple of ways are and then also ponder how does that continuing undermining of our femininity, not showing up fully as, mm -hmm. as females, as women, potentially perpetuate the masculine, the masculine culture, the masculine dominance, so that we're not showing up as fully female indefinitely as lawyers and as clergy leaders? It, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, look at this suit. <laughs> you know, it's a nice, tailored, my husband bought it for me, conservative suit. And I'm dressed in the, in the typical way. Um, but if you think, if you think of, of women's fashion, uh, I was, I've been thinking about this when I don't have to dress this way, which is quite nice, I'll tell you, not to have to do that all the time. But um, women's fashion, um, it, it's, if you think about it, um, we're always sort of clothed or urged to clothe as those more vulnerable. Guys will wear ties. Women will have our, our throats exposed. That's not good in the early days. Um, or we're, um, you know, high heels. I mean, sometimes they make us look great, let's say it, but you're not going to run very far in those. So the, the, if you think about at least Western fashion uh, promotes women as sexually um, available, as vulnerable, and, and as childlike, and when that's, that's something we have to think about. But on the other hand, if we're just going to dress up like, like guys, then, you know, but we have to because we're not taken seriously when we're dressed other ways. There was a whole book, Dress for Success, big in the 80s. When some of you are old enough, I have a whole closet full of ladies' foulard ties. <laughs> you know, my kids use them, use them for hair bands when they got older. But, you know, we were dressed like junior men. But then uh, we were accepted. So it's a difficult thing. And, you know, if you think about English jurisprudence and their practice, what are they wearing those wigs for? You know, it's not a good look on the men, but clearly that is not a female fashion. But they are to look like men when they're at the bar. It is, it's a tough thing, yeah. Unfortunately, we're at the end of oh. our time, so let's ask, uh, thank Bishop Eaton for our comments. She likes sports. She's our new honorary Tomcat. Tommy. Tiger. Tommy. Tomcat. Tomcat. Your, your, your school are Tomcats. That's great. Thank you very much. We begin tomorrow at uh, 8.15, I think.